morning. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> Did you experience the reality of God during that worship time? When you feel that reality, when you sense his presence in a very special way, you kind of feel like you can take anything on, right? There's that, there's that rest that we're talking about. You experience it in your heart. You can take anything on. You're ready to go. Last Sunday, some said, I really needed to hear that message. Almost in the sense, I'm ready to go now. But you walk out the door, get in the car, and the problem is that Monday comes, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday. And the problems aren't removed. They're still there. The heartache, the grief, the fears, they're still there. Where did the rest go? Do you ever feel that way? Come on, do you ever feel that way? We all do. As a pastor for years, I would feel that way. Sunday was a great day. People were there. And you'd go wet back home and you'd be excited and then you realize I had to do it again next Sunday. You know, could I get another message up that would move people or, or, or stir lives, you know? And the challenges that would come. But that was only a part of it. But all of us experience that. And sometimes, I even know some people don't come to church anymore because they feel so good. And then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday come and everything falls flat again. And you can't help but think, does God really keep his promises? Is there really rest? Let me tell you a story. You probably know this story anyway. Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments from God. You remember that? What? That must have been a phenomenal experience. You know, The cloud comes over him and God encircles him and gives him and actually writes out the Ten Commandments on two tablets. And he's carrying them down the hill. Can you imagine how he felt? Excited. God's with me. This is going to work. We're going to make it across the wilderness. We're going to get into that promised land. It is done, finished. And he had all that wonderful background. God delivered them out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea. And man, is he excited. And he comes down, and guess what he finds? Do you remember? The whole nation of Israel had spent their time worshiping a golden calf because he was up in the mountain longer than they thought he should be. You ever do that? You know, you ever want to worship something else and put your trust in something else because God's just taking too long to answer this prayer request, too long to take away this problem. And that's how Moses felt. Moses got the Ten Commandments, and I, I, I can see him in utter frustration, throwing them down on the ground, turning to his brother who, who helped make the calf, and saying, what are you doing? Talk about your dreams and your hopes evaporating. And then God, for a moment, tells him, I'm not going to go with you anymore. I'm going to send an angel. Because if I go with you, I'm going to wake these people out for false worship. And Moses says, oh my goodness. I not only, I, then I have these people. No. And Moses said, if you don't go with me, I don't want any angel, only you can go with me. And then he prayed this prayer. And this struck my heart so much just two Fridays ago. I was sitting thinking about this series that we're doing, Finding Rest in a World of Unrest and felt the anxiety of getting before everybody and talking and trying to lead them in rest. And here, I'm a nervous wreck. What am I going to say? What am I going to do? Is this going to go over? Will this really be good? And then underneath, will they really think I did a good job? You know? 
And as I sat down on the chair on that Friday, I said, Lord, why am I so anxious? And he says, you don't trust me. And then he gave me this verse as I sat down on the chair. As I sat down, a verse came to my mind. Teach me thy ways, O Lord. And I said, where is that verse? Why are you giving me that verse? Where is it? So I went to my concordance. I looked in the concordance, and it says in Exodus 33, 14. So Exodus 33, 14. That's the Moses story. I kind of stole the story from that. And I went to that passage, and this was Moses' prayer. Lord, teach me, thy, teach me thy ways that I might know you and find favor in your sight because these people belong to you. And then God's response to them was this. And this was his response to me. And this is his response to you. I will go with you and I will give you rest. You hear that? You're not leaving the presence of God when you leave the church. We don't have Antonio. We don't have the worship team. We might not have the preacher. We might not have the fellowship. But we have something greater. We have something greater. I will go with you, and I will give you peace. But Tom, that's what you talked about last week. You talked about the fact that there's a possibility of rest, and I'm just going to read for you. Let's look at what we mean by rest for a moment. What is the definition that we've been kind of working with as we talk about rest? It's that calm confidence that the presence of God will enable me to deal with the realities of life. The calm confidence that the presence of God will enable me to deal with the realities of life. And we kind of looked at Psalm 62, and that's what we're going to look a little bit at again today. Psalm 62, when we spend our attention on verses 1 and 2, you might be saying, Tom, why are you using a pad rather than your Bible? Well, I found out last week that my NIV, I used the edition that was published, I think, in 1983. And it's a little bit different than what you see behind me. And I didn't want to confuse you. So what I did was go to Gateway, and I put up Psalm 62, and I copied it out, and it's right here. So that's why I'm using this. It was a lot cheaper than buying a new Bible. So that's why I'm using this this morning. And we looked at verses 1 and 2 as... And we read the testimony of David, him stating truly, and remember we looked at that adverb. We mentioned the fact that that adverb appears, truly, appears in verse 1, verse 2, verse 4, verse 6, and uh, verse 5, verse 6, and verse 9. It appears six times in that psalm. And if you were reading it in Hebrew and saw the Hebrew poetry, it would kind of jump out at you. And we mentioned, too, that it has a dual meaning. It not only is affirmative, this is true, but it also has a restrictive kind of thing. I don't know a better word to use. And, it's, it, and you add to it, and this is the only thing that's true. And so that's why sometimes in translations, as a matter of fact, the one I read uh, last week was the fact, it reads something like, my soul finds rest in God alone. And so they put the adverb at the back, and they use alone. And you'll see that in different translations because they can't capture the whole thing unless they use two words. But anyway, maybe I'm losing you. So anyway, so David makes that statement, truly, my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. So David's finding rest. And you might say, well, of course, he's the king of Israel. He's successful. He sits on a throne. He conquers all his enemies. Who doesn't find rest like that? I would too. If I had the home I wanted, if I had the job I wanted, if my bank account was secure, if I had long-term insurance, if everything was all right, you know, I'd, I'd be happy too. I'd be really at rest. But note what David goes on to say. 
truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. And you say, I wouldn't be shaken either. All the bills paid. Everything's taken care of. Perfect marriage, perfect children, on and on and on. And that's what David had. But listen to what he says. Look at the following verses, verses 3 and 4, which we really didn't look at very well. How long will you assault me? Would all of you throw me down? This leaning wall, this tottering fence? Surely they intend to topple me. From my lofty place they take the light in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. I don't think any of us have ever gotten into a situation like that. What David is referring to, and he refers to it even more in Psalm 3, is the fact that his son Absalom has turned against him and is trying to take the throne away from him. He's gathered the majority of the people of Israel on his side. He has thousands and thousands in his army. He hates his father, and we won't go into why. David's best friend and closest counselor has turned on him and has joined sides with Absalom. Talk about your world falling apart. Your own son wants to topple you. The nation that you gave your life to led them into battle doesn't want you anymore. And there you are with just a few that are still faithful. I want a God that will give me rest in that situation. Don't you? Don't you? I remember after doing the series last January or January and how God seemed to bless that and was at rest and everything was fine and we really thought God's presence is here and, and I remember that Joni, my wife, had, had, had a cough and and her chest was bothering, and she had it the whole month of January. And she said, there's something more here. And so she called the doctor, and the doctor looked at her and said, I want you to go to Emory uh, in Johns Creek, and I want you to have an x-ray taken. And so she had the x-ray taken, and, and they found an embolism, pulmonary embolism, and, and they, she had to go right into the hospital. But we rejoiced that God revealed that so early. And we were happy, so we passed that first test. We found rest in God alone. And as we were rejoicing, because she only had to stay one night, we were, so she stayed one, two days and one night, and they released her about 6.30 or so, and they told her to take a certain medication for blood thinning, and so we left the hospital. We had two cars because I had come up later, uh, not knowing uh, when she went for the x-ray that that would be the, uh, the, whatever it was, what was it that she got? But anyway, and so we had two cars, and so she could come out, and she seemed to be fine, and so we left the hospital, and, and we drove home, and, and of course I won. <clears throat> and, uh, and not that I was racing, and uh, I got there first, and, but we went to the drugstore. We went to the drugstore first, Walgreens. And we'd been there often, it's about a mile from our house. And I was waiting at Walgreens to pick up the Zarelto with her. And I was there for about 20 minutes waiting for her. And I said, I didn't drive that fast. You know, and waited and waited and waited. And then I said, I'm going to come out of the drugstore and give her a buzz to see what's wrong. And I walked out of the drugstore and I got the phone. And I rang, and it rang, and it rang, and it rang, and it rang, and no answer. And I looked up at the intersection of where the drugstore was. Pretty good size intersection. And there was ambulances and police cars gathered around there. And I said, my goodness, what is that all about? What is that all about? And then I said, I wonder if Joni's caught in that. And so I walked up, and as I walked up toward the light, a woman came running at me and said, are you her husband? Are you her husband? I said, I don't know. I don't know. 
You know, and then my eye caught our car. As my eye caught the car, it was spun around, and I saw the side that was crashed. And I said, yeah, I'm her husband. The father's reality from my life was my soul finds rest in God alone. Came around the car, and Joni was kind of okay. Car was total. She was in the hospital and recuperated, still recuperating from the injuries and the hurt and the pain. And that's just a small sample of what many of you are experiencing at a far greater level than I am. Can I still count on God to give me rest in the realities of life? Because that's the realities of life in a broken world. And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. And I'm learning more and more what that means. And that's why I want to take the next couple of minutes huh, to go through the next verses, verses 5 through to the end. And you're going to see some things as I've looked at this more and more. I said, Lord, why didn't you show me? Because this has been a favorite passage of mine for years these verses, especially the first two. And I said, Lord, why didn't I look at this more closely? Because my life has not been a real example of rest. Why? Because verses 5 to the end move us from David's testimony or David's experience and declaration to how he begins to share with how he found that rest and how you and I can find that rest. It's not just for the super saint. Because it's not the super saint that gives us the rest. It's the super God. The super God that gives us the rest. And the question is, how can I take that hope that I have here in church and take it home with me and it begins to be a reality in my life? No matter what I face, he is bigger than what I face. He promises to give us rest. How? Look at the first step. You probably don't see it because it's rather subtle. But if you'll notice as you read the song, as you begin verse 5, you'll notice that there's a change from what he states in verse 1. Sounds the same, but he says, Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. I looked at that, and I said, that's a little bit different than what he says in verse 1. And you know what the difference is? In verse 1, the find rest is a declaration. In verse 5, the word rest is a command. It's in the imperative. And what I began to realize is the fact that David is not now declaring. He's now talking to himself. You know that statement that I said when somebody comes up to me and says, you know, boy, I, I, I enjoyed what you preach. I really needed to hear that. That's a half truth. I need to hear it Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, Sunday night, Monday morning, Monday afternoon, and every moment of the day. And that's what David's doing. He's preaching to himself. He's preaching to his soul. What do you mean he's preaching to his soul? He's reminding himself of who he is, and he realizes he has control over the messages that come his way that he wants to believe and build his life on. Do you know how many messages in the course of the day you're battered with? The messages from TV, advertising, movies, entertainment, you name it. The messages that come to you at work. And the messages of, of the fact that, well, the messages that come. And the messages that come from within, the fear, the concerns. And they haunt us. And they keep us away at night. And they make us afraid. And we don't know what to do. And it seems at times we can't control those messages. 
What do we do with them? And, and so we escape. We turn on the TV. Or we go away. We hide from them. David never ran from, from the difficulties and troubles that he was facing because he knew. He knew who his God was. And so, but he needed to continually state the message to himself. He needed to continually preach the gospel, the truth to his soul. And that's why he says, again, my soul, he's addressing his soul, my soul, find peace, find rest in the Lord. Don't go any other place. Don't seek any other way out. My soul, find rest in the Lord. How about you? What messages are you listening to? What messages grab your attention? What messages control your soul? What messages are you basing your life upon? Boy, how the world has messages that can really control you and allure you. The world has the hope. If you get a better home, you'll be happier. Or if you, if, uh, one of the messages that, that is amusing to me, and one of the grocery stores has it every Thanksgiving. And every Thanksgiving, they show you a beautiful table with a beautiful turkey and all kinds of fixings on top of the turkey and a wonderful, perfect family around the table. And the thing is, buy your food at boom. And, and the insinuation is what? If you buy your food at this restaurant, at this store, you're going to have a happy family, you know. And it's innocent. I know that. But more and more, you know, what is success? Success is this. What is happiness? Happiness is this. And they define the terms and they tell you the way to get it. It's on TV. It's wherever you look. And David says, I refuse to listen to those messages. I refuse to allow those messages to control my life. Let me give you an example. You might say, well, this is so theoretical, Tom. I, I don't get the point. I don't get the point. Well, do you know Psalm 103? Many of you know that by heart. But let me turn just for a moment and turn to Psalm 103. It really hit my attention what David is doing in Psalm 103. It's a Psalm of David, Psalm 103. And listen to what he says. Praise the Lord, or many of you memorized it as saying, bless the Lord. And he's not encouraging the congregation to bless the Lord. Do you see that? You aren't looking at the Bible. Okay, so you can't. Bless the Lord, O my soul. He's talking to himself. It's the same what he said in Psalm 62. Find rest in God alone, my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. He repeats it. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Though that source that gives us so many of our messages, that creates so much of our fear, our depression, our anxiety. David is saying, I'm going to give you input. I'm going to wire you. I'm going to preach the truth to you because I need it preached to me more than just on Sunday morning. I need it preached to me more than simply as I open my Bible to read a few verses Monday morning or Tuesday morning before I go off to work and get involved in all of the messages of the world. David says, I need to wire. I need to program. That's the word. I need to program the computer, my soul. And so he says, soul, don't forget your benefits. And he keeps on going. The reason why he keeps on going is because, oh, my soul, uh, the, you know, he, he, he continues to use the singular. And he begins to list the benefits. I have a God who forgives me. And boy, how David needed to be forgiven. If we know some of the sins in his life, if anybody needed to be forgiven, David did. And do you know... I know in my own life the sins of my past sometimes haunt me. Do they ever do that to you? I guess this is why I'm not successful. I guess this is why I don't sense the presence of God. I guess this is why uh, God doesn't favor me. I get, no, it's not. If you have confessed your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're haunted by past sins, 
You need to reprogram your soul. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed your transgressions beyond you. Don't let Satan bring up the past. It's under the blood. It's been crucified on the cross. Christ paid the payment for it. You are forgiven. Okay? And boy, he'll bring your past up. Preach the gospel to yourself. Preach the truth to yourself. But he doesn't go on there. He says, who heals all your diseases. And what I think he means here is the fact that the hurts and the injuries and, and some of the health problems that we have, God knows God will heal, God will touch, God will support you. He is in with you in the deepest problems, in the deepest sorrow. He is here and he has ways to heal you. I think especially of some that have lost, lost a child or a loved one. It's hard for God to heal that, isn't it? Can't bring back the child. Can't bring back the husband or the wife or the parent. But God can heal the grief and the sorrow that you feel. He can heal you. He knows. He is the God of all comfort and the God of all care. Do you believe that? If you don't, Talk to your soul. Program that in. Say it over and over again. Instead of as you drive in the car, instead of listening to the music, turn it off and talk to yourself. Preach the gospel to yourself. This is why it's so important as you come to the word of God and Psalm 119 tells us, hide God's word in your heart. Why? That you have material to preach to yourself. That's why. That's one of the reasons why. That you have the material. Memorize the word of God. Have, have that supply. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He will never leave me or forsake me. All of my sins have been removed from me if I've repented. And on and on. You have that reservoir to call upon, to bring before you. Shut off the messages. And use one message. One of the great messages, and most of you know, is Psalm 23. Do you know it? The Lord and the comfort that brings. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters in the worst of difficulties. He leads me, O oh my soul. You don't have to get upset. The waters might be rough, but you... He will guide us beside still waters. He leads us into green pastures. He restores my soul when I feel so empty, so lost, don't know what I'm going to do. It seems that God's so far away from me. He restores your soul. Keep preaching. Keep preaching. He restores my soul. And when I go through the valley of the shadow of death, he not only leads me out of it, he is with me in it. He is with me in it. And not only is he with me in it, in that very valley, he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And he sups with me. And he communes with me. How do you respond to that? How do you respond to that? That was David's testimony. And it can be ours. It can be yours, yours, mine. That's what God wants. The same thing. You say, not only money to the word of God, you can reprogram yourself. Some of the songs that we sang this morning were tremendous, weren't they? Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, worship team. Take them home with you. Well, you can't. I can't take Antonio home with me. Shelly won't let me. But don't you wish you could? But turn on the radio, the music. Sing hymns that you know. When I sit down sometimes for devotions and spending time with God, hymns just come to me and in the car. Of course, I'm from another generation. Hymns like, how great thou art. 
Hymns like, great is thy faithfulness. Hymns like, it is well with my soul. There are resources that you use to reprogram yourself, to speak to your soul. And we could go on and on and on. Who redeems us, etc. Do you get the point? I'm just going to deal with all three. But anyway, it looks like I'm not. But let me know, move on to the next one. The next one. So the first one is preach the truth to yourself. The next one that I want to pull your attention to, and each one, why they stick out if you're reading it in Hebrew is because they're imperatives. But now he moves from preaching to his own soul because that has revived him again. He begins to declare to others. And listen what the next one is. He says, down to verse, verse 8. Trust in him at all times, you people. He's begun to remind himself of who his God is, that his God is a rock, that his God is a refuge, that his God is a God of salvation. He's begun to reprogram that now. He's begun to see his God as a mighty God. That's one of the songs we can sing. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns in heaven and earth. He's begun to remind himself now. He knows now. He's reprogrammed his soul. And now he can begin to proclaim. And the first thing he proclaims is trust in him at all times. Why? Because he knows who his God is. And now he knows that he can trust in him. He might not feel like it. The situation surely hasn't changed. The army still surround him. He's still in deep water. But he knows now that God is with him. His soul is settled on that. And now he can trust his God at all times and in all situations. Now, I know that one of the quick objections to that is, well, Tom, I don't have that kind of faith. Have you ever heard that? I can't believe like you do. I can't trust like you do. Well, it's not the amount of trust that you have. It's not the amount of faith that you have. It's the object of where your trust is. All of us can trust. All of us can trust. The question is, what are you trusting? The first question was, what messages are you listening to? When you straighten that issue out, the next question is, what are you trusting? Did you realize that when you came to church this morning, how much trust you exercised? How many came to church in a car? You trusted it. You know, cars, tires blow out. Accidents happen. When I stopped at the red light and went on the green light, you trusted that the people on the other side, unlike Joan, will catch you. They'll stop. You trusted that. Now, you don't know who the other drivers were. You have no idea, but you trusted them. We all trust. We couldn't live life apart from trust. The issue isn't trust. The issue is the object of your trust. Do you get that? Do you understand? How many have ever flown in an airplane? Oh my goodness, you are trusters. You have plenty of trust. Do you realize what we do when we get into a plane, a piece of metal? We have no idea who made it. You know, we don't know how trustworthy they are. We don't know the crew that put gas in and fixed it up. We have no idea of who they are. We don't even know who the driver is. Is he sober today? Did he have a good night's sleep? We have no idea. And here I go. I get in the plane. I sit down in the seat. I buckle it, and everything's fine. And then I take off and go five miles up in the air. And I trust. I don't know who's driving, etc. But I trust. We all trust. The question is, who do you trust? What do you put your trust in? And David was able to move his trust from the size of his army, from a peaceable situation, from the security of being king of Israel. He removed his trust from all of that and he placed it in his God because he began to remind himself of who his God was. 
And immediately the rest came because he knew his God was bigger than Absalom, bigger than the thousands that were against him, bigger than the nation that had turned against him, bigger than the plot that was put against him because nothing can measure up to our God. And that's why it's reasonable to put your faith in him because no one else can compare to him. Listen to how kind of David explains it. He comes, if we come down, he uses the negative in verse 10. Do not trust in extortion because what he's talking about or excuse me, I'm going to start at eight, verse eight, 9. He says, and he uses truly again. He says, why tr- the reason why I trust in God is because if I trust in man, they're but breath and they're going to die. Whether they're highbrow or lowbrow. Whether they're normal work people or rather they're on the throne or in high positions. He says, why put your trust in them? You can't trust them. They're only going to be here for a short time. You don't know what's going to happen to them. They might turn on you. You don't. So why trust in them? Eliminate that. If weighed in a balance, they are nothing. Together they are only breath. And then he says, well, if I can't trust in them, uh, how about extortion? How about forcing my way on it? Using oppression to get what I want out of people. He says, no, because that's contrary to God's will. He, hate, he hates oppression. And so if I use oppression, I'm going to, he's not going to help me. And so therefore, write that off. He says, well, how about stolen goods? Hey, how about if I don't report this on my income tax? How about if I change this here? How about if I do this? How about if I do that? And we spend lots of time. And, and David says, no, that doesn't work anyway. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. And how we trust riches. How we trust riches. But how it has a way of taking them away from us. And even if he doesn't, they won't supply the deep need in our hearts. I like to compare it kind of like, how many have gone to the ocean? As a kid, I used to love to go to the ocean. Loved the ocean. That was up in Philly. We used to go to New Jersey, Ocean City. We loved to go there. And you know, as you go down into the ocean, as you you go into the ocean and play on the beach, et cetera, sometimes you get hungry and sometimes you get thirsty because, and you know, here's a whole ocean in front of you. It glistens, it's beautiful, it's fun. And and, and, you know, and so as a kid, why not go and get a glass of water from the ocean? I mean, it's beautiful. Look at all the fun. Look at the waves. Look at how it sparkles. Look at how attractive. And we really have fun in it. You can splash in it. You can swim in it. It's, you know, it won't quench your thirst. It'll make you thirstier. And so you have to come up out of the beach, leave what seems to be so much fun, and go to the fountain on the boardwalk. You know what a boardwalk is? Okay. And drink there. The world looks so attractive. It's riches, it's wealth. The messages that we receive make it so attractive. You know, if you go on this vacation, if you wear these clothes, you'll be beautiful. If you go on this vacation, you'll relax like you never relaxed before. If you buy this home, all your problems will be gone and everybody will know that you're somebody. On and on and on and on and on and on and on. And as we drink, the ocean's messages. It creates a tremendous thirst in our hearts that only God can solve. As David said, as a deer pants after the water, so pants my soul after you because only he can satisfy the deep need of your heart. No wonder, David said, trust in him at all times. It's no issue. It's obvious. He's the only one you can trust. He's the only one that's sovereign over all. He's the only one that's the rock, the solid ground that will never change. He's the only refuge for your soul, a resting place where you can come and rest. But I am going to get to the third one. I'm cutting all of this short. 
The third one is the one to me that I needed to learn more than any other one. You see what it is? Listen to what David says. Pour out your hearts to God. Now you might say, oh, I got the peas. Preach the truth, put your trust in God, and pray. Yes, but no. Because so little of our praying is pouring out our hearts to God. You know why I can pour out my heart to God is what David says here, for God is my refuge. He's a safe place. And I can pour out my heart to him. All my fears, all my anxieties, all the guilt at times I feel, all the failures, all the disappointments, sometimes all the disappointments I feel in him when he hasn't kept his promises to me as I think he should, as the pe things I'm praying for don't come to pass and it goes five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. I think we prayed 30, 25, 30 years for Joni's dad's salvation. And finally, he came to know Christ. But the questions during those 30 years, doesn't he answer prayer? Isn't he interested? And some other special ones that have come to pass. But, and listen, let me give you an example of David pouring out his heart to the Lord. I don't know what passage to turn to, but I'll turn to this one. Psalm 42. Let me read it. No, Psalm 55, excuse me. Listen to the heart of David. What do I mean by pouring out your heart to God? Listen to David. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught. At the voice of the enemy, at the stares of the wicked, for they bring down suffering upon me and revile me in their anger. Can you get the sense of it? Here's the God, here's the man that said, my soul finds rest in God. But this is how he found that rest. He reprogrammed himself. He refused to trust in anybody else. And he poured out his heart. My heart is in anguish within me. Is there anyone here that has a heart that's in anguish? Maybe it's an unsafe loved one. Maybe it's, I don't know. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. Doesn't sound like a man that finds his rest in God, does it? It doesn't sound like a man who says, I will not be moved. What he meant was, I won't be moved from my trust in God. I pour out my heart to him. I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove, that I would fly away and be at rest. You ever, ever dream that? I could just fly away, get away from it all. I would flee away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter far from the tempest and storm. Have you ever felt that way? David did, and he wasn't afraid to pour out his heart to God. That's praying. That's praying. It's not a quick prayer. Though quick prayers are fine. I'm not minimizing that. But it's not until we begin to pour out our hearts to God, our fears, our reservations, our disappointments, and you've heard me, I'm just repeating what I already said. Because God wants a relationship with you. You see, we've been talking a lot about principles and we'll be doing, getting completely away from that because we're going to another passage next week. But God wants a relationship with you and a relationship has to involve talking and interaction. And God wants to share your grief, your pain. He wants to know where you are. Well, he already knows it, but he wants to talk. He wants to hear you. 
Sometimes we go to Cracker Barrel, Joan and I, for breakfast, and it always kills me because we kind of go to talk and share. And you ever go to Cracker Barrel restaurant and the husband and wife are reading papers? Newspapers, you know? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. They probably went for the meal. But anyway, you know, and that's so much of our lives. We read the Bible, but do we listen to God? We pray, but are we pouring out our hearts to him? Are we laying our burdens upon him because we know he cares for us? He's a safe place. He wants to hear our sorrows, sometimes our guilt, sometimes even our sin that needs to be confessed and acknowledged before him. He wants to hear. He loves you. He wants to meet you where you are, as you are, so that you can have his rest in your life. What did David do? I'm jumping to verse 16. But I called to God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. He ransoms me unharmed from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me. God, who is enthroned forever, will hear you, and he will afflict the enemy. Men who never change their ways have no fear for God, but he cares for me. I end with that. That's what God wants. Can I share two quick stories, or one quick story in a prayer? I don't know how many of you are familiar with Johnny Erickson Tata. Do you know her? Are you familiar with her? This is one of her books. She's written many. She wrote this after being a Christian for 40 years. Or she was a teenager, and she drove, dove into a lake and broke her neck and became a quadriplegic. And there she was, paralyzed from the neck down for years, for uh, 40 years, when she wrote the book. In the book, and I suggest you read it, 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 the book is called A Lifetime of Wisdom. It's a marvelous book. And Johnny shares the heartache of never again being able to walk, use her hands. She was the one that painted with a paintbrush, I think, in her teeth. And the heartache, some of the stories break your heart as you see what's happened. But you know what she says? She said, when I first broke my neck and became a quadriplegic, my first response was, God help me. My second response when he didn't help me was anger. And I turned away from God. She said, that didn't work either, and so I just committed my life to God. And after 40 years of being a quadriplegic, this is what she says at the end of the book, and this is out of my leg. She said, I would never trade that wheelchair for anything because of how real God has become to me. That's out of my leg. My soul finds rest in God. There is a prayer that I loved, I found years ago, and you might be familiar with it. It's the prayer of the Confederate soldier. Listen. It was found on his body, so they say. But this is what he prayed. I asked for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I may learn humbly to obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything that I hoped for almost despite myself, 
My unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most richly blessed. I will go with you, he promises, and I will give you rest.